Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Fred Kemp. I'm president and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Uh, Mr. Khodorkovsky, I think you can see by the audience here uh, the large amount of interest there is in today's session. Uh, and so thank you everyone for joining us today. And thanks also to all of those who are watching our webcast online. Uh, this event is public and on the record, uh, so I encourage you to follow the conversation online and tweet your reactions uh, using uh, hashtag ACRussia. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all to a co co conversation with Mikhail Khodorkovsky. Um, Mr. Khodorkovsky and I met, I think, a couple of times, but the last time, if I'm not mistaken, was in 2003 in Davos at the World Economic Forum. And I remember that very clearly uh, as I was then the editor of the Wall Street Journal Europe because you were speaking quite prophetically about the dangers and the problems ahead in Russia. And I don't think many people were very focused on the world that you were seeing ahead. And that, of course, is the reason that uh, you founded Open Russia in 2003, an organization to foster European values within Russia. Uh, after founding it, you were arrested, convicted, and sentenced to nine years in prison uh, for charges of fraud uh, and tax evasion, charges widely believed to have been fabricated uh, or, at the very least, uh, politically motivated. Um, I believe it was the hotel at that time that was the Russian hotel in Davos, the Sunstar, and I, I just remembered that conversation vividly. Uh, you were declared then a prisoner of conscience by Amnesty International and only released and exiled by Vladimir Putin in December 2013 prior to the Sochi Olympics. You have compared your release from prison to one of the Back to the Future movies where the protagonist returns home to find his country altered, sick, crime infested, ruled from above like an imperial fiefdom. In 2014, you relaunched Open Russia to once again organize Russian citizens to build a state governed by the rule of law and regulated by free elections. We do a lot of work around the situation in Ukraine at the Atlantic Council. Uh, we are determined that Ukraine should be able to decide its own destiny. But equally, we are determined uh, that Russia uh, belongs in a Europe whole and free where it should find its rightful and peaceful place. And we're dedicated to that as I know you are. Just last April at Stanford University, uh, you said and you described a vision of reform and a return of the country toward a path of freedom and prosperity. You said it is a dream of, quote, successful, smiling, self-confident people who have jobs they love, who don't have to struggle for existence day in and day out where every citizen who obeys the law can feel himself more confident than a president who violates the law, and where the state has no choice but to respect people's rights and international obligations. The Atlantic Council shares that same vision for a confident, prosperous, and peaceful Russia. Just last week at the Atlantic Council's Wrocław Global Forum in Poland, we heard from similar uh, Russian activists such as Ilya Yashin, who has continued Boris Nemtsov's work following his death, culminating in the publication of Putin War. We also hosted Gary Kasparov, the former world chess champion, who presented one of our Freedom Awards posthumously to Nemtsov, to Boris Nemtsov, and his uh, Nemtsov's daughter, Jana, Jana accepted uh, the award on her father's behalf. Kasparov described his friend Nemtsov saying, quote, Every war has its front lines where only the bravest of the brave volunteer to fight. Boris was one of those rare knights of freedom who, knowing full well the dangers and the odds, uh, battled every day as if he were invincible. We know no one is invincible, uh, Mr. Kordakovsky, but we are uh, delighted to have you here. Uh, we're very sore, sorry that Boris uh, Nemtsov is not here, and we're very sorry uh, that others are in danger as well. Um, before I invite uh, Mr. Uh, Kor Kordakovsky to the stage, I'll note that we have provided you all with uh, headphones uh, to access simultaneous translation uh, from Mr. Kordakovsky's Russian into English. 
uh, and Russian will be on channel two, uh, uh, English will be on channel one, and I believe it's a similar arrangement in the webcast so that people can listen this way in the webcast. Mr. Kordakovsky, the floor is yours. Webcast. Mr. Kordakovsky, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to welcome you here. The Atlantic Council is created as an organization with the goal of fostering the development of transatlantic cooperation in tr trade, security, and politics. If we look at the way that post-war history has played out, it can be said that your organization, along with other parties to the process, has enjoyed considerable success. Almost every country in Europe has today succeeded in transitioning to democratic forms of governance. However, there's a part of Europe where many problems remain unsolved. In the wake of the events in the Crimea and in eastern Ukraine, there are many who are forecasting a, in, an increase in tensions, the further isolation of our country, and even a renewal of the Cold War. But there is an alternative scenario for the future, which, as I see it, will inevitably come in the medium or at the least the long term. And this is, this is exactly what I would like to speak about today, how to transition from isolation to integration of Russia into the Euro-Atlantic community. First, let's talk about isolation. Sanctions have seriously hurt the Russian economy and of course, in, for modern Russia, it, it has far fewer resources than the Soviet Union once had. Nevertheless, it, Russia has enough of them to keep things tense for the next 10 or even 20 years. Another question is, at what price? Of course, a new arms race and exclusion of Russia from the international scientific and technical and, and trade, trade systems will have an impact. Even now, a redistribution of the budget expenditures taking place. The state is stopping investments in social capital and is putting money into arming and the security structures. In the first quarter of 2015, military spending totaled a record 9% of GDP. This means less money will be spent on schools and on hospitals. The, in the long term, this will lead to a serious deterioration in people's quality of life. The current confrontation with the West is absolutely artificial. The cooling of relations has been inspired by those Russian elites who want to hold on to power. They desperately need an image of an enemy who would distract the uh, populace, the attention of the populace, from the corruption and inefficiency that exist in the, in the power. Uh, inflaming the internal and external confrontation is the only mechanism, uh, and we must admit that it is an effective mechanism, for the survival of the current regime. Perhaps you recall and saw that in 2011 and 2012, our country had outgrown its current authoritarian and retrograde leadership. 
uh, uh, the discontent among the middle class was growing, they began to demand a different quality of public services and institutions. The discontent metamorphosed into mass protests. At that moment, Russia was ready to make a transition to democracy, e competitiveness, and self-government. It, it was only at the cost of enormous propaganda efforts, panderings to the dark instincts of the of the uh, mob, was the power able to turn this uh, turn this process around. In in order to preserve power, they are preserving the country's isolation and are pushing Russia back into the Middle Ages. The next question is the interrelationship between Russia and the West, which is a complex intertwining of interests. In order to find a way out of the current situation, we must first understand that all the relations of between Russia and the West, uh, all the participants have different interests. The U.S., the old Europe, the new Europe, the Russian regime, the Russian people. It is important to understand, to realize that the national interests of Russia and the U.S. are objectively contradictory with one another. There's no avoiding that. And that these uh, contradictions, contradictions, if the policy isn't right, can easily lead to tensions. Today, relations between our countries are at their lowest ebb since the end of the Cold War. But that's not the end of the world. We've, we've seen worse. Periods, all the periods of escalated relations between Russia and the United States have been, one way or another, uh, interspersed with perhaps brief but definitely memorable thaws. The lesson to be learned here is that a, a, abrupt uh, fluctuations in emotional states are lethal for U.S.-Russia relations. In part, today, our countries in their relations with each other are paying for the illusions they had during the perestroika era when it seemed that there were no contradictions between Russia and the U.S. When the reality hit home, both sides turned out to be ill-prepared for that. Of course, this does not justify today's rancor and suspicions, but it goes some way towards explaining them. The good news for the two countries is that their strategic, long-term interests of these two countries overlap in many ways even today. The main political challenges we have are the same. Terrorism, the rise of Islamic, Islamic extremism in the Middle East are equally dangerous for both Russia and the U.S. In fact, perhaps even more dangerous for Russia, given the situation in the south of our country. The new China likewise presents a, a common competitive challenge. The bad news is that in the political elite of today's Russia, there is no one to advance the country's true national interests. The interrelationship, indeed, between the state and the national interest has always a, was always a problem point in Russia. The reason for this is obvious. The state in Russia, for centuries, has given voice to the interests of the Russian bureaucracy and the ruling classes, and not those of the Russian nation at large. Therefore, there has always been a chasm between Russian uh, 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 elite interests and Russian national interests. And sometimes they have coincided, but nearly always the Russian bureaucracy has given voice to the national interests 
in a distorted form. Today, as I have already said, these interests have diverged fundamentally. The ruling regime in Russia is in desperate need of confrontation with the U.S. and the West, while the interests of Russian society would, would require the closest possible cooperation with the Western world. Unfortunately, uh, there can be no talk of any new strategic rapprochement while Putin remains in power. In Russia, there's such a system has been built under which any decision can be suddenly changed at the caprice of one person, at the whim of one person, who is not uh, controlled uh, by any internal political mechanisms. After that, the court politologists are going to uh, uh, sincerely uh, um, convince flabbergasted experts that the decision that is contrary to the previous one is completely logical and legal. We have already observed this many a time. But thanks to the fact that Russia has a monopolized media, such abrupt changes of direction find support among the greater part of Russia's population. All the more so, leaders of other states who have access, as they do, to objective information assume quite reasonably that Putin is often deliberately feigning madness and unpredictability, considering this to be a shrewd political move. In this situation, to speak of strategic rapprochement seems naive to me. Nevertheless, we need to fight at least to uh, the, that at least uh, within the current containment strategy would not allow for a real global war to happen. As you can read and see and observe, the current regime is prepared to, to play this game. But don't think uh, more about these people than they need to. They do want to stay alive after all. But, but they can certainly get too carried away with their game and not. Uh, and the main thing is to not let this happen. Sooner or later, the, the, the collapse of the system will occur. And w we need to prepare for this event even now. The West must establish close cooperation with Europe-oriented part of Russia's society and set up mechanisms for our country's rapid reintegration into the global system after the reg regime change. We're not going to have a big window of opportunity. Uh, the, the, non, the incomplete integration of Russia in the 1990s has uh, created a bad situation both for Russia and for Western society. And now let's talk more about integration. Russian citizens, like citizens of any other country in the world, want security, they want to live comfortably, they want a good education for their children, and they want to be confident about tomorrow. We are no different in this respect. As history of the past hundred years has shown, such a transformation is impossible without integration into the Western world. We're, we know of several successful examples of economic transformation in the 20th century. Germany, Japan, South Korea, Italy, and even China. All of their transitions to a new stage of economic development began with, with improving relations with the West. I want to bring your attention to the following. Russia is the only northern country in the world that has not made a transi transition to democracy. When the current regime leaves the scene, the United States and Western Europe 
in my view, must make every effort to facilitate, facilitate Russia's economic integration. With the West must in no way uh, repeat the, the mistake of not fully integrating our country. Russia's accession to NATO and the European Union after regime change, as fantastic as this may sound today, is absolutely necessary to us, just as necessary to us as it is for the West. Of course, such a move will lead to a reformatting of these institutions. But the alternative is worse. A more diversified economy and exports in combination with the free movement of people, including a visa-free regime, uh, free ideas of ideas and capital. This, this is the guarantee that uh, Russia will not have a, uh, a, an authoritarian regime uh, established in its country that's dangerous to its neighbors, because one of the key instruments wielded by the current authorities is the ability to take under control the sources of uh, economic rents and to buy the loyalty of television, security services, justice system, etc., with this money. In a, a technologically advanced, diversified, Western, deeply integrated, deeply Western integrated Russia will prevent a potential dictator of an econo to have an e economic base and popular political support in society because it'll form an alternative interests and power centers. And now allow me to summarize what I have said above. Here's what we need to understand about today's relations between Russia and the West, from my point of view, and what we must be striving towards. Number one, Putin's Russia today is heading down the road of self-isolation, but this is an erroneous path, and after Putin, the situation will certainly change. Item two, Western society on its side, is it's just as important for them to ensure not the isolation of Russia forever, but it's, it's gradual, even difficult integration into the Euro-Atlantic world. Number three, Russia, from the point of view of its historical genesis, the mentality of the people, the dominant elements of culture, Russia is a European, or let's even say Euro-Atlantic country. And it's objectively interest in European and Euro-Atlantic integration. In the end, this will entail accession to NATO and subsequently into the EU. Item four, despite what's going on right now, Russia remains the most powerful and economically developed country in the post-Soviet space. It must therefore assume the mantle of directing European and Euro-Atlantic in integration of the whole post-Soviet space. It's precise, precisely from the point of bringing into the region political, legal, and economic standards. This too is the mechanism, uh, or this then is the mechanism for uh, the Russian Federation to restore its moral and political authority in the vast post-Soviet space. Item five, whether anyone wants this or not, it's imperative to uh, put to impact the current political the current political regime in Russian Federation to uh, incline it towards a conventional position on key questions. Item six. It is vital for American elites to understand and perhaps even accept that Russia has its own objective interests. These interests will have to be translated into action by the next generation of Russian elites, some of whom, in terms of their personnel, will overlap with the current uh, elite, as critical our attitude towards that may be. Item seven, 
Russia has no objective of containing China, our biggest neighbor. But the future of the, Ru the future Russian Federation can develop a joint common policy on China together with the U.S. and the European Union. Its es essence, interaction without domination. And finally, item eight. We, those who see Russia differently, are looking for allies that will help Russia to finally cement its place in Europe. Russia, in its turn, will become for the West an opportunity to take part in a new economic leap forward, an, an important factor in neutralizing a variety of global threats, including terrorism and Islamic extremism. This is how I see the most important challenges that we have facing us together. Mikhail Kordakovsky, I think you've given us some, uh, some food for thought. Um, uh, I thought that was a masterful presentation, and, and certainly in a year where uh, we're not sure we can even get Montenegro past the post uh, of NATO membership, it certainly, certainly it opens up a whole new line of reasoning, and I think it's really fascinating. Um, let me ask a couple of questions before I go to the audience. Uh, and we have a good period of time. I think we have until 2 o'clock for, for a discussion here, so we'll, we'll be able to dig down in some of these ideas. Let me start a little bit with where we are now, and then I really do want to touch on your vision for the future, because I think that uh, it's a really healthy, um, a healthy place to go. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot going on in Russia we don't ent entirely understand. And I, maybe you can actually start by, um, uh, con you, you've condemned leaders like Ramzan Kadyrov for participation in uh, large-scale corruption and lies and, and ties to organized crime. There was also a Chatham House report talking about the role of state officials increasing in uh, so-called asset grabbing across Russia. Can you talk about the role of organized crime with the state, uh, where one, you know, where, how, how it works together, the overlap there, and then how is that already influencing uh, uh, Russian entrepreneurship, uh, civil society, politics in Russia? To my deep regret, my notion is that to today that, that a part of the Russian bureaucracy is organized crime. That is, these are not two separate things. When I was in jail, I met with no small number of incidents when the state bureaucracy at various levels, all the way from ordinary policemen, all the way up to generals uh, in uh, esteemed federal agencies, were engaged in direct and unconcealed taking away of property from people who were in jail. In fact, they were so not embarrassed about doing these things that it was clear that they're not afraid of, of, of any consequences from doing this. Kadyrov's regime in Chechnya is merely one, well, perhaps the, the most uh, uh, visible examples of this general trend. When 
my colleagues were take, making the film The Family and were doing interviews with Russian citizens residing in Chechnya, they found uh, uh, quite a few confirmations, corroborations of facts of m m the mass collection of tribute, not only from businesses inside Chechnya, but from ordinary citizens, including citizens working in government agencies. But beyond that even, they found corroboration of the fact that such actions are being undertaken by by the security structures of, of Chechnya, even on the territory of Russia outside the Chechen Republic, which, in my view, confirms of, of the fact that the, uh, the regime has become a criminal organization. And this reflects on its international politics as well. Let's pick up on that a little bit then. Um, with that being the case, uh, the picture you paint uh, of Putin is as a Putin, and we talked about this outside the room as well, who is likely to be around for another decade. So when you talk about regime change, you're not talking about regime change in the coming months. Uh, you're talking about uh, a decade out. Uh, when you look at some of uh, uh, the recent repressions uh, in Russia, that's either the sign of an authoritarian that has things well under control or one that's getting a little bit more fine. That's a sign of weakness. Which is it? And how does Ukraine fit into this? So uh, looking through this model, how can we understand what Putin might do next uh, in Ukraine? The system that was built by Putin is extremely contradictory internally. Any specialist uh, in management administration governance can understand it easily. What he has built is an extremely centralized vertical structure that, that all focuses in on one person. What's the advantage of such a system? It easily mobilizes resources to resolve the tasks that it has set for itself. What is its shortcoming? The number of tasks that this system can deal with is limited to the number of tasks that one person can hold in their head at one time. Furthermore, this entire system is based on this one person. And if he is sick, or has some emotional difficulties, the entire system becomes unstable. This is exactly what we are seeing both in domestic policy and in Ukraine. When Putin makes a decision, these decisions start being implemented. There are plenty of resources for this, but he can't hold one question in his field of vision constantly. As soon as his attention is diverted to the side, the personal, private, and mercenary and unpredictable interests of entirely different people start calling the tune. And these are not necessarily people from his inner circle. This is one of the reasons why I say that attaining strategic or trying to reach some sort of strategic agreements with Putin is impossible because they, there's no guarantee that they're going to be carried out. And my view is that today 
for the Russian power and for Vladimir Putin specifically, it's not a good decision to stop the conflict in eastern Ukraine because that quantity of nationalists who have now been concentrated in that area, if they were to return to Russia, they're not going to say thank you to Putin for that. On the other hand, though, expanding the zone of conflict for him is also not a winning situation because by doing so, the potential of these this quantity that I mentioned of, of, uh, of these this quantity of these potentially destabilizing elements will only increase. This does not mean that the conflict is not going to be expanded. He's, he doesn't want this to happen, but there are, is a sufficiently large number of people who are interested in this, and he, as I've said before, is not capable of ho holding on even such important questions in his field of vision for a long period of time. I think that the solution to the problem at this stage will be a freezing of the conflict, and this is, in my view anyway, the only real realistic decision that could be made, unfortunately, as of today. Fascinating insights. Uh, imagine for a moment that I'm that you're speaking here to the next president of the United States, and since since everyone else is running, why not? Um, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 what? How, how do you? How, how, Sorry. How, how do you, or, or that you're with uh, President Obama right now? How, how, what do you tell him? How does, what, how should he be managing the crisis right now with Russia? What steps should he be taking? What is he doing right? What is he doing that's wrong? As of today, the conflict in Ukraine, in the eyes of the majority of people in the whole world, with the exception of Russian citizens, is not a conflict between Russia and the United States of America. Russian citizens, 84 percent of them, are absolutely convinced that that's exactly what it is. Nevertheless, in consequence of the fact that the government of the United States cannot make statements, cannot not make statements or not do anything about this conflict. Because of that, one uh, gradually the impression is created in broader and broader circles that this really may be a conflict between Russia and the United States on Ukrainian territory. And this situation is going to keep on developing in this direction. If arms start being shipped to Ukraine, the process of such a transformation uh, in people's heads will go even faster. Then you have the question, is the American administration ready to step into this conflict and to win? Because if it is not ready for that, this will be interpreted as America having lost. I am not an American politician, and I don't sense American ready, uh, the readiness for this in American society. But American politicians, in my opinion, need to very carefully weigh the situation in the balance that in today's informationally transparent society, it is impossible to try to scare someone uh, with something that you do not actually intend to follow through on. And 
this is the base upon which one needs to make such a decision. Question, uh, the broader question of how you handle Putin, there's still a lot of talk, I think, in this town, also other places of Europe, that one has to try harder to find an off-ramp, to help him find an off-ramp, because one has so many other interests, Iran, Syria, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, what is your answer to those saying that with the personality uh, that you've described in mind? I have already said, and I can only repeat, that in my view, the Putin's real interest today uh, it would be a freezing of the conflict in Ukraine. Will he be able to make this happen, given that there are, is quite a large number of people already who are already interested in a, a, a heating of this conflict? Uh, there's a lot of money that can be made from that. It's hard for me to say. But if we're speaking of objective political interests, I would say that this is what they boil down to. And here, once again, I would like to say there is no opportunity to for uh, to reach an agreement with Putin strategically one time about what's going to be happening happening further down the road in Ukraine. This is going to be constant, constant conflict situations similar to what exists today, well, for example, between North and South Korea or maybe in Transnistria. And the United States, I'm afraid to say, has no way to escape being at least a moderator in this process. Uh, the uh, declining oil price, the economic situation in Russia, uh, is this having an impact on Putin on, uh, on the situation? How do you judge that? There is no doubt that those sanctions that were introduced, especially in the part that uh, uh, restricts Russian access to capital markets, have reduced the p regime's potential in relation to its foreign policy, uh, let's put it uh, mildly, initiatives. But <clears throat> the potential of this part of the sanction the, of these sanctions has already been felt. That is, the markets are already closed, and the, maybe the situation for Russia will improve if they open, or the situation will remain the same if if these sanctions are not lifted. But it's not going to get worse. The s sanctions of the second type, the technological ones. These, of course, have a longer time horizon for their impact. And as of today, their influence is very limited. But it will become very noticeable in the medium term and the long term. The whole question here is how much the Western camp will be prepared for unity in this regard. As we know, our president, speak when he spoke before the Russian people, said the situation will change within two years. I'm not as confident as he was about this. Audience, I want to touch on the part of your speech that's, that's futuristic and Russia as a Euro-Atlantic country. Uh, we've seen 
uh, Russia over the years uh, go from uh, a Western view to an Eastern view. Uh, what gives you confidence that this is ultimately the way Russia, Russia or Russians want to go? And in some ways, I think you're saying you're not confident that, that one would have to undergo some sort of massive short-term intervention from the West and from a group of Russians that would believe in this over a short time frame or Russia would revert uh, to a Putin-like situation. Can you explain your thinking behind that? And, and is the thinking different if it happens six months from now than if it happens 10 years from now? I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I want you to go a little bit from theory to reality of, of, of how, how things are likely to unfold. Um, in the White House, I know, and also in different parts of Europe, part of the fear is that if Putin would fall, uh, it's by no means certain anything better would replace him. In fact, you know, one could even have uh, uh, a worse situation. Uh, at least that's what I'm told by, by people who are doing scenarios uh, right now. If, we, if you ask Russians about democracy, or about a European path of development, the greater part rejected. This doesn't mean a thing, except that the propaganda has very successfully undermined in people's consciousness in Russia. Uh, 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 they've replaced one set of terms with another set of terms. One of the most reactionary and at the same time uh, funny political parties in Russia, or foolish perhaps, uh, that insists on often uh, on not national but nationalistic interests and slogans is called the Liberal Democratic Party. Yes, Mr. Zhirinovsky, exactly. In other words, it's a question of terminology. When we ask about, uh, when we ask our citizens, would they like an independent judiciary? Would, would they like regular transitions of power? Are they interested in having local self-administration and uh, uh, having local government have local sources of income, uh, of revenue rather? And all these things that are liberal and democratic values. We get huge part of society that says, well, of course, yes. If we take a map of Russia, it will seem to us that the country is mostly in Asia. But if we take a, a map of Russia that's weighted to the population of Russia, we'll see that out of a population of 140 million, 120 million live in the European part. And the part of the population that lives in the European part is increasing. So I have no doubts whatsoever that in actuality, after people figure out the real meanings of the terms, the question of uh, whether Russia is or is not a European country is just not going to exist. As concerns fears of, of who might come to replace Putin, well, let, let's look at the real and not made up interests of the Russian elite, not even Russian society. Let's just look at the elite. 
what, are they interested in isolation? Of course not. You, you, know how, you know how many apartments there are in New York, London, Miami? I assure you there are far fewer in China. This is a part of Russian society wants, that wants to live uh, behind five meter high fences as this used to exist in the last years in the transition from the uh, apartheid regime in Africa was taking place, that's what it was like. I've, I've seen how people live there. You think Russians want to live like that? No. They may be forced to, but they definitely don't want that. Therefore, the likelihood that some kind of person like Zhirinovsky even would come to power in Russia after Putin for any length of time is, I, I think, is the chance of that are absolutely zero. Furthermore, I'm afraid that the current regime itself is exhausting the whole limit of movement in this direction, and it'll only be better after them. Yes. Mr. Kharkovsky, I would like to uh, quote uh, a part of your interview with Die Welt. Only the next Russian dictator will be able to return the Crimean Peninsula back to Ukraine. Under the democratic system that I would like to see in Russia, uh, we would not be able to return Crimea to uh, Ukraine. I have two questions. First of all, what does democracy have to do with it? And second, do you see yourself in the post of President of Russia? I wouldn't want to try and guess right now uh, something many years in the future, but what can be said with total confidence is that people who promise the Ukrainian people that they will return the Crimea to them and pay compensation. are not going to get the vote of Russian people. This is why I say that to uh, have a short-term uh, solution to this question in a democratic way is not going to happen. Although, to admit the fact that the annexation was done uh, in violation of international treaties and international laws as we understand them. Well, any person uh, with a healthy mind would agree with that. So wh what kind of solution do I see? I see that the Russian society can be convinced and one could get their votes for the gradual resolution of this problem on, along the model of say, Hong Kong, that is uh, autonomization, a free economic zone, a, a long-term lease, etc., etc. I understand that this question uh, is going to have to be dealt with by anybody in power in Russia at some point, and I realize that the mechanism for solving it does exist. But whoever promises to resolve this issue quickly and unambiguously is never going to, to get the support of Russian society in the voting booth. Uh, the other question, I've already talked about it. Uh, I don't want to waste time on, on questions that have no practical value right now.
lady right here. In the, identify yourself and make sure that the, these are questions and not yeah. speeches. Yeah. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate your significant analysis and projection on the, the future of the, the dynamics of the situation. Uh, I'm Elaine Serrero. I'm a resident associate rector for Wisconsin International Ukraine University. I'm based here in Washington, D.C., but uh, WIU is a Ukrainian university in Kiev. And my question has to do with a number of the points you've pointed out. Uh, what would you see happening that we could do now since so much of what will take place is 10 years out. How can we prepare, particularly with students in the population, to dilute the disinformation that has been presented? Uh, what ha do you see uh, we can do particularly, and what would you advise with in reaching out to the student population. The, Rus the Russian student population in Russia. In Russia yeah. mm -hmm. and also Ukraine and other nations. In other words, social media, yeah. the whole dynamic. Could you address that? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And I think this is a broader picture question because we are seeing the use of information on behalf of uh, Putin, uh, in, not just in warfare, but in general toward Europe, and et cetera, et cetera. How does a free society as our own combat information? So I think there's a second part to this, too. One of them is posed to students, but the other is in general, how do we counteract information warfare? I am not a specialist in mass communications. But before dis making a decision, one needs to first make the diagnosis. And unfortunately, that's something that I can do. Today, the opposition part of Russian society and Western society are losing in the information war. That is, those false messages that are being advanced by the Putin regime's propagandists get to the ears and the minds of a significant part of Russian society and a certain part of people residing even beyond the confines of Russia. We need to recognize this, admit it, and deal with it. How? That's something mass communication specialists need to tell us. B because the truth should beat lies not only in fairy tales. Uh, thank you. The State Duma is now trying to transfer the uh, elections to the Duma, uh, make them three three months earlier uh, than they should be. Yevgeny Gontmacher said in Vedomosti that this is such an unusual step that doesn't have any obvious advantages for the Duma. Maybe it means that they might be preparing us for early presidential elections as well. And Gauntmacher is proposing that these elections could take place even as early as next spring and not in 2018. But the question is, uh, what do you think of the likelihood of such a scenario? And if you think that is possible, are early elections an advantage for Putin or the contrary? Uh, a weak thing for him, because even his opinion, uh, only in, in, in two years will the Russian economy start improving. Uh, it'll only be lower in a year. But if it does happen, then how will the Russian political opposition be able to make use of all these weak spots in this area so that Vladimir Putin could, well, let's put it this way, not become president? 
wondering about that at the Atlantic Council. Add to that the resignations, the recent resignations uh, as well. Uh, so uh, the, the early elections and the recent resignations, what's going on? Uh, objective grounds for uh, rescheduling the elections of the president to an earlier time, I just don't see any. Which does not mean, in our country, where all decisions are made by one person and on the basis of his internal emotional calls, it's, it's not possible that such a decision may take place. But I just don't see any objective reasons for this. As concerns the governors, yes, many governors are trying to get the, 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 the still high support of the, the, that the current political regime has, trying to take advantage of that in order to get themselves another term as governors while their popularity is still high. Uh, it's understandable that this it's easier to do today than perhaps in a couple of years. At the same time, the opposition is duty-bound to use in the interests of Russian society even those elections that are not really elections. For this, it is imperative to use them with the objective of getting to the Russian society a uh, message about what the alternatives are, the existence of alternative people, alternative ideas, and alternative organizational structures. I very much hope that the uh, that this will uh, the Russian opposition will be able to do this. I and the organization that has been founded by me, well, we're trying to help the Russian opposition perform just these tasks. Mikhail Borisovich, it is a great pleasure. Several weeks ago, Masha Gessa wrote uh, uh, an article about if, if, if 2007 has just happened. Um, I agree that it still hasn't come, but uh, I'm worried that to help the help of the West will. Uh, um, will only accelerate the repressions and reactions of the Kremlin. We have already seen have already seen how the, the uh, organization of civil society has been persecuted because of its connections with the West, uh, the, uh, the, which is what the government of Russia has done. We in the West will are we going to? Um, uh, um, create a greater threat for these people who are working for a better Russia, better future for Russia. How can we avoid uh, causing them harm? I consider that the authorities are imposing on Russian society and on the Russian opposition, uh, Russian civil society, it's the independent part of the Russian civil society, a false notion about how contacts with the West, uh, working together with the West, uh, are something bad. They're treason. This is a provocation that's aimed at having the 
European-oriented part of Russian society, and it is not so small, especially in the big cities. F make it feel itself as being in isolation. It came out of international integration, and as a result of this, as it has turned out to be dependent on the regime. Yes, we must be attentive in explaining, must be careful about how we explain our steps before speaking here, uh, an opportunity for which I'm grateful to the hosts of this organization. I laid out my main points in the Russian press. We need to be open and we need to understand that we are first representatives of Russian society and not representatives of Western society in Russia. But if we understand this ourselves, if we are indeed representatives of Russian society and we honestly speak about those questions that we are uh, advancing here, then what do I care that the Putin regime and the people that have been deceived by it don't like that? I, I am from Crimea. You mentioned that after the collapse of Putin's regime, Russia must join the European Union. What do you think? Are countries like Germany or France, the leaders of the European Union, r ready to accept such a big country as Russia into their community? Or a Russian patriot. We yet have yet to have an English question, but uh, <laughs> uh. this is the second biggest problem. The first problem is that Russian society is not ready for this yet. But we know how op opinions in society change even in historically short periods of time. Germany itself is one of the finest examples of this. This is an objective necessity. Today, Europe has exhausted to a significant degree the potential for its own development. the potential of the development of Europe can be found, among other places, in Russia, while the potential of Russia's development is in Europe. And sooner or later, even Russian citizens and citizens of the United Europe are going to realize this. And because this is an objective reality, To explain it to people, to convince people of this, is the job of politicians. That's what their job is. Thank you very much. My name is Miro. I'm from Embassy of Georgia. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have a quick question. Uh, Georgia has been occupied by Russia. 20% of Georgia's territory is still occupied. Uh, they just signed an agreement, an alliance and partnership, which is nothing but regular annexation. So if you were president of Russia, and we hope that someday some liberal people take leadership in Russia, how would you, uh, how would you handle this conflict? Do you think this is conflict between Georgians and Ossetians? Georgians and uh, Abkhazians, or do you think this is Russian imperialism politics in South Caucasus? Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 
to my deep regret, this conflict, as you know, has been going on for a long time, not even, uh, uh, even more than a decade. And to count on uh, ha finding a quick solution to it, uh, is, uh, there is no chance of that. My point of view is that this conflict can be settled in a peaceful fashion, for sure, definitely through the will of the citizens of Georgia and the citizens residing on those territories that are today not part of Georgia de facto, the role of Russia in this process, it can't, it can't be that Russia cannot participate at all, because it's clear that Russia does have interests in this region, but uh, participation through force must be 100 percent ruled out. I'm on the Atlantic Council Executive Committee, and thank you very much for your vision today and your objective reality as you describe it. Um, I'm going to go back to the Obama administration and today. Um, if you were advising the Obama administration, um, would you uh, advise them to uh, increase the um, uh, presence of uh, equipment? in uh, the Ukraine area, um, would you advise them uh, with regard ha diplomatically how they address Putin, uh, which sometimes can be, in, in my view, very provocative? Um, in other words, is there, um, so in, in one, my second question is about is there a way really to deal with Putin uh, diplomatically? And my first question is really, um, is, is the uh, placement of more uh, equipment, et cetera, uh, uh, just another provocative thing that really will not um, uh, pay off in the end? Uh, in, in other words, would you suggest that the, the whole US debate be a little really more about non-lethal weapons? Yeah. And what, you, yes. That's what you mean by the equipment, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. First of all. The United States of America must answer for itself the question, what is America's place in the world tomorrow, in tomorrow's world? And depending on how much American society is ready to continue as before to support the position of sole superpower? Or does America want to get rid of this uh, role? Depending on that decision, w one needs to then take the next steps. As concerns Putin, my view is that this is a person who's oriented at, towards force. If he sees force on the other side, he's ready to talk. If what he sees on the other side is empty threats, feints from, from his perspective that express themselves as, say, the, the supply of a couple of armored cars or something like that, 
then at the propaganda or level, this is certainly going to be used, but from the point of view of real uh, acceptance by Putin, the, the, on, the only reaction you get from him is laughter. Uh, I apologize for a less than diplomatic answer, I guess. Better mean it. Um, but uh, there's so many questions. We're almost running out of time. I'm going to pick up two right here. You've been very patient. Please here uh, and 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 there on the other side of the aisle, and then we'll see where we are with time. Здравствуйте, меня зовут Артур Барон. With the German embassy in Washington, you've said that both Russia and the West need to start preparing for that moment when there will not be a Putin regime anymore. What interests me is from your point of view, what concrete measures are required for that today? If, for example, we take the example of Ukraine, the West tried to integrate Ukraine into the European Union, and that didn't quite work out as we can all see. What needs to be done differently and better at that moment when the opportunity presents itself in Russia? I think maybe the last question, but we'll see. Thank you for your speech. It was very interesting. My question concerns Russian foreign policy. Today it's guided by the conception of that uh, Russia has its sphere of privileged interests. Factually, this means that Russia retains the right to veto uh, qu on questions uh, concerning the national development of the countries of the former Soviet Union. The s countries themselves are not in agreement with this. They want to determine their own fates by themselves, nor are the countries of the West in agreement with this. And this has become one of the reasons for this confrontation in Ukraine today. In, in your opinion, what do you think Russian foreign policy should be uh, to, towards its neighboring countries? I do not think that the West showed enough will in the question of or that it is demonstrating enough will in the question of integrating Ukraine. The West sees problems with this, and yes, of course they exist. Uh, it sees the advantages much more poorly. Uh, and in my view, the West doesn't understand at all the risks of not sufficient integration. I don't even understand why people who have such great historical experience in various areas of European problems from the countries that are in, in such an unstable position, why they can't apply this historical experience sufficiently to Ukraine and understand how much it applies to Ukraine. I am firmly convinced that no intellectual per in personnel uh, idea expenditures on the integration of Ukraine with the European community are excessive. And all the more so, this will concern Russia in its transition period. Any power that comes to power in, in Russia with European Euro-Atlantic values 
is going to have no more than two years to once again try to show Russian society the advantages of such integration. If the West is going to spend this time thinking it over, if the West is not going to see this as an opportunity and will see it only as risks, we will lose and we're going to get ourselves a new Putin. But to become aware of this, to prepare for this, including by way of working with the, the Russian diaspora that is outside Russia today, and which today in its significant part is prepared to go back to Russia once Russia changes. If we don't do this, right now we've still got the time for it, but if we don't do it, we will lose. We will lose again. And what this loss will mean for the whole world, uh, I, that scares me to even think about it. We have already verbally gotten to the point of global war. That's We're talking about that. We're already verbally prepared for this. I don't understand. D do people even understand what a global war is? I get this impression that in s the 70 years that have happened without global wars, people have simply forgotten. They think that this is some kind of a computer game or something. Now, as concerns Russia policy, Russia's policy uh, concerning its nearest neighbors. I am in favor of Russia competing for influence in the countries that are Russia's neighbors, cultural influence. I believe that the Russian culture, the Russian language, Russian values that are common to our civilization, and I do feel that we are part of the common uh, Euro-Atlantic civilization, they can flow from the new, outwards from the new Russia. And from this point of view, Russia could lay claim to being a leader in the so-called po post-Soviet space. I will agree that Ukraine could uh, lay claim to this kind of leadership, Belarus as well, but we have more opportunities as Russia. This has to be, though, a competition for for pluses, not competition for minuses. Thank, thank you. Uh, we've run out of time. I apologize. I know there, are, there were at least a dozen, if not more, people who would have liked to have asked their questions. Um, uh, this was a really rich presentation, rich discussion. This is the kind of intellectual exchange we really need to have here in Washington at the Atlantic Council, and frankly globally, on the future of Russia and, and alternatives for Russia going forward, and the stakes that Russia has and the stakes that the West has. So I want to thank you for uh, your excellent presentation, for this rich discussion. Thank all of the audience for coming here, and I don't think we've had this much r Russian spoken at the Atlantic Council in our questioning, uh, perhaps ever. So this was, this was a very interesting group of people. Thank you very much. <laughs>